Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to another true crime video. So the video that I have for you guys today is one of the most tragic random acts of violence that I've pretty much ever covered in a case. I know I say that all of these cases are absolutely so frustrating, but this one is very frustrating for a different reason. But before we get into it, I need to take a moment to say a huge thank you to my patrons, Nay, MB, McD, Lana, Brooke, Nicole, and Sandy. Thank you all so, so very much for your support. It's because of you guys and the rest of the Patreon family that I'm able to keep doing what I love and keep spreading awareness about these very important cases. So so once again, from the very bottom of my heart, thank you all so, so much for what you do and for your support. Okay, so with all of that being said, let's get into today's case. Today, we are going to be discussing the devastating murder of Isabella Thales. Isabella Joy Thales, who went by the nickname Bella, was born June 9th, 1999 in Denver, Colorado to her parents, Anna Hernandez Thales and Joshua Thales, and she had two siblings, a sister named Lucia and a brother named Jacob. Now, Anna and Joshua, Bella's parents, they were high school sweethearts. They were married when she was 18 years old and he was 19 years old, and soon after, they welcomed their first daughter, Bella. Two years later, they had Lucia, and then after the birth of her sister, Anna and Joshua actually got a divorce due to issues that they were both dealing with that they just didn't think were healthy to be having in a household with children. However, after 10 years after this amicable divorce, they did get married once again for five years before they divorced once again for good. Bella and Lucia, who actually goes by Sia, described their childhoods as being pretty hectic just because of all the fighting and arguing that was happening within their household. They both felt like they had to mature very quickly because of the issues that their family was facing. Then Anna went on to have Bella's half-brother, Jacob. For the time being, when Bella was a teenager, she lived with her mother, her sister, and her half-brother. Bella was described by others as being a free spirit. She was extremely independent and was a woman who just could not be chained. She was sympathetic, open-minded, kind, loving, and smart. She was a forgetful girl, coming home three times each morning before actually leaving the house for the day, which definitely reminds me of myself just going to the car, realizing that you forgot something, and then coming back and getting that one thing, and then going out again and being like, okay, I forgot the next thing, going back and getting it before you actually get to leave for the day. She was also described as someone who would help anyone who needed it without a second thought. She and her family attended a local Christian church, and they would often host family dinners with their extended family almost every week. Bella was in the Girl Scouts growing up, as well as gymnastics. She attended Cherry Creek High School, and while there, she continued gymnastics and was on the cheerleading team. She loved doing modeling and posing for some local photographers and designers in Denver. She also loved doing her makeup and coming up with new, unique looks. She always had a dream of studying fashion. However, she wanted to get a degree in something more practical after high school, so she went on to study accounting at the Metropolitan State University of Denver. In high school, Bella didn't really date much. She had a couple of boyfriends here and there, but nothing was ever all that serious. That was until she met a man named Darian Simon when she was 20 years old. Darian Simon was six years older than her, and he too had similar experiences in terms of growing up in a bit of a tumultuous household, not having the best example of what a good relationship is supposed to look like. Darian was a photographer and the co-founder of a clothing company called Be A Good Person. The two initially met through mutual friends, and their relationship started off as the two just being friends. They were in a talking stage for most of 2019, and they weren't ready to accept the other as being an exclusive couple. The two were dating other people, but finally, Darian officially asked Bella to be his girlfriend. He said something like, what are we doing? We love each other. We bring out the best in each other. Why aren't we a couple? I think this is super cute and actually a very accurate representation of dating in this day and age. 
Either way, once they officially started dating, things progressed really well for them. They would tell others that the relationship that they had between the two of them was different than anybody else they had dated before. When they were together, they both felt safe and comfortable. They said that neither of them had to put up walls when they were with the other one, even though they had built up these walls in previous relationships due to their family histories. But that wasn't how it was with the two of them. When they would have disagreements, they figured out ways to work through it. There's also a bunch of pictures of Bella modeling for Be A Good Person, so it seemed like they did a lot of things together and she modeled for him and did work for him and they seemed like a power couple. Now, at this time, Bella was living at home with her mother. However, it was reported that the two of them had this argument that sort of put a strain on the relationship that Bella had with her mother. We don't know exactly what was the cause of this argument or what was said, but it was said that this argument ended with Bella's mother telling her that she needed to move out. So because of this, Bella moved out and moved in with Darian into his new apartment in Denver's ballpark district with his dog Rocco, a sweet, loving 85-pound pit bull. It was a new residential development in the area that was still under construction near the Coors baseball field. So by June of 2020, Bella was about to turn 21 and her sister Sia, whose birthday was also in June, she was about to turn 19. So by June 7th of 2020, the two threw a joint birthday party together on the rooftop of a local restaurant. They had an absolutely beautiful cake that was so beautiful that nobody wanted to cut into it, so Bella took it home still fully intact. The next day, she sent her mother a picture of her eating a slice of the cake for breakfast the next day. Then on that same day, June 8th, she made her last post to Instagram. It was a photo of herself and two friends where she talked about the protests for the recent death of George Floyd with a message to her followers to donate, advocate, and stay safe. On Monday, June 10th, Bella and Darian slept in that morning. She was freshly 21 as her birthday was just the day prior. She had plans to meet up with her mother that day for brunch where her mother planned on giving her her actual birthday present that day. Bella had always borrowed her mother's designer shoes, so her mother bought her her own pair of designer shoes for her 21st birthday. So when they went to brunch, that was the plan for Anna to give Bella the gift that she had bought her. Now, Darian also didn't have too many plans for that day other than just staying home and playing video games with a friend. That same day at around 11.40 a.m., Darian grabbed his dog Rocco's leash, put on some flip-flops, and headed towards the door to take his pup on a walk. Now, with this being right in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic, Bella was honestly just looking for any opportunity that she could to get out of the house and do something. So she told Darian that she wanted to come along for the walk that day, so she did. So they left the apartment and walked down the street with Bella holding on to Rocco's leash. They then headed to a spot of dirt that was nearby, located right next to some construction that was in the area where a lot of people in the neighborhood were known to bring their dogs. Once they got to that patch of dirt, Darian took a few steps away from Rocco and Bella to go sit in some nearby shade, and then Bella stood on a low brick retention wall while holding Rocco's leash and encouraging him to go potty. At this point, the entire week, it seems like Rocco may have had an upset stomach or something. He did have a command to poop and he usually followed it, but he hadn't gone poop in a couple of days, so they were really trying to get him to go. I've been in the same situation where I know that my dog really needs to go and we don't really have the time to like let her go all day. So I'm like, come on, let's go potty. Let's go, Willow. Like, come on, let's get it done. And you know, maybe... I've sounded rude to my dog when I'm saying that because you can get a little bit frustrated, but that situation has definitely happened to me many times and I'm sure it's happened to you guys tons of times too if you have a dog. However, as they were doing this, as they were trying to encourage Rocco to go potty, 
Darian recalls hearing a voice coming from the building that they were standing next to saying, hey, are you gonna train that effing dog or are you gonna yell at it? At this point, Darian sort of just ignored the comment. He said that he really couldn't see who it was in the window, so he didn't really want to yell back. He kind of held himself back because he didn't want to escalate something into an argument that really didn't matter at that time, so... In his head, he said that he was just sort of thinking, who is this guy and why is he so hostile? Basically, he was thinking in his head, what is this guy's problem without actually like yelling back something rude to him because again, he didn't want to cause too much of an argument. So he looked over at where the voice was coming from and he noticed that there was a man standing in a window that was pretty much completely dark on the first floor of a nearby building. He said that he wasn't sure at this time if it was like an apartment building or some sort of office building or something like that. All he knew was that some dude was just standing there in the dark yelling to him about his dog. He realized that maybe Rocco was going potty in the lawn of this apartment building, but obviously they're gonna pick it up, so there shouldn't have really been any issue. So Darian yelled something back to the man saying, my dog is trained fine, I've had him for four years. After this, Darian stood up and walked over to Bella. He said that he sort of had a bad feeling about this. He didn't really want anything to happen, so he wanted to leave the situation. So he got over and sort of motioned to Bella to walk away from there with him. But as he motioned to walk away and they started to sort of, you know, turn to leave, Darian looked back at the window and this time he saw the man more clearly. He saw that a man was standing there at the window and he was pointing the barrel of a rifle right at them. Again, this was a totally random person that neither Bella or Darian knew. It was completely out of the blue. They didn't ever do anything to this man in the past that they knew of. They had never seen him before or anything like that. So at that point, Darian recalls saying, are you pointing something at me? At that point, Darian thought that maybe he was just pointing a pellet gun at them or something like that. He really didn't know what to make of the situation. But that, unfortunately, is not what it was. So as Darian went down to pick up Rocco's poop before leaving, all of a sudden, one after the other, this man opened fire. Darian stood there as he heard shots ringing out one after the other over and over and over again. Then he saw Bella collapse to the ground and as she was doing that, he could feel bullets whizzing by his body. He turned around to run away from the scene, but that is when he also fell to the ground. As he was falling, he was trying to do whatever it was that he could to get away from the man who was shooting at them from the window, but he could no longer walk. His leg just stopped working, so he started crawling. He actually made it about 20 feet through gaps in two different fences before his body just sort of gave out and he could no longer move. He said that in this moment, he remembers just laying on the ground, having no idea what was going on. And as he was laying on the ground, he was just, you know, staring out at the ground in front of him. He kept telling himself that this was just a horrible dream and that he was going to wake up from it soon, but he actually had been shot at that point, one time to his buttock and one time to his leg. Darian said that he actually remembers laying there and seeing people just walking right by him and not helping him as he was laying there bleeding, unable to move until somebody finally came to help. This was actually a man that was a neighbor of Darian's. I don't think they knew each other, but this was a man who was nearby and he heard the shots go off, so obviously he was wondering what was going on. This man had also just completed EMT training six months before, so he knew exactly what to do. So he grabbed a belt from a nearby construction worker and he tied it around Darian's thigh to create a tourniquet and this saved Darian's life. I believe it was about a half hour or so, it might have been sooner, but around a half hour after Darian was shot, an ambulance arrived 
Now, when Darian and Bella went on the walk, neither of them had their phones with them. So, Darian wasn't able to call 911 right after this happened. So, people around the neighborhood who heard the shots being fired, they were the ones who were calling into the police with these reports. In the initial reports to the police, all people knew was that they heard shots being fired. They didn't know that two people had been shot. So, I'm assuming that the police reports of someone actually being shot weren't made until either this EMT came to help or somebody who saw the EMT helping Darian. So, I'm assuming that's why it took so long for help to get to Darian, but at this point, as Darian was laying there, he had no idea what had happened to Bella. So, once help arrived, obviously, he was put into an ambulance, given pain medications and sedatives, and eventually, they arrived to the Denver Health Medical Center he needed surgery immediately to repair the damage that he had suffered. The gunshot wound to his leg completely fractured his femur. He required multiple surgeries to repair his femur, including a metal rod that was placed into his thigh to hold the bone together. But after multiple surgeries and a long ICU stay, he did survive. He would later go on to say that after talking to several medical professionals, first responders, and police officers, they all told him that it's a miracle that he survived. They said that even five to ten years ago, they didn't have the medical advances that we have now, so at that time, if this had happened that long ago, they probably would have had to completely amputate his entire right leg. But he was able to keep his leg and he was able to walk. I actually saw that a little over a year after his initial surgeries, after this metal rod was initially placed, this metal rod had actually snapped in half. He had to undergo his fifth surgery to put the metal rod back in place that kept his femur together. Then after that, he needed two more additional surgeries to clean up different parts of his femur and then remove a temporary bone graft that had been placed. Now, as all of this was happening with Darian seeing Bella fall to the ground and Darian being saved and sent to the hospital, Bella's family had no idea what had just happened. Sia remembers that her and her younger brother just got done picking up food from Benihana when she got a call from one of Bella's friends. The friend asked if she had talked to her sister lately, saying maybe she should try and call her, and obviously she did, but she wasn't able to get a hold of her. Then, Sia actually checked the location on Bella's phone, which showed that she was still at Darian's apartment. Then, another friend contacted Sia again, saying that she should probably contact Darian's family. Then, they sent her a link to an article that talked about a couple being shot. One person died, and one person was gravely injured, and this took place in the same neighborhood that, obviously, Sia knew Bella lived. At that point, Sia just happened to be next door to the Target that her mother was actually at, and her mother was at the Target buying Bella her birthday present. So, she called her mom to go meet her at Denver Health, which, of course, she did. All they knew at this point was that there was a shooting in their neighborhood and that one person was dead and one person survived and was in the hospital. They didn't know who was who, but obviously, Bella's family was hoping to find her at the hospital, but that is when they found out that it was actually Darian who was in surgery. At this point, Sia, Anna, and now Joshua, they all went over to the crime scene where Bella had been shot. They knew at that point that this probably did not end well for her and that she probably was the one who had been killed. It was said in one article that I found that Bella's mother had seen an article which had an overhead view of the crime scene and the body was covered up by a tarp but her feet were sticking out and Anna immediately recognized the pedicure that Bella had gotten for her birthday, so she knew that it was Bella. At that point, police did contact Bella's family, but obviously she had already heard about it from these articles that were sent to her immediately, so she already knew at that time. By the time the family arrived to the scene, obviously police were all around and it was blocked off with tape 
and the police had to confirm to the family the horrible news that Bella had been shot. But police also had the duty of keeping the neighborhood safe. Neighbors remember police officers running through the streets, warning residents that there may be an active shooter in the area and urging them to stay inside. I do also want to take this moment to tell you that Rocco is okay. At this point in a lot of the articles, I was also wondering if he was shot and as far as I've seen, I don't think he was injured in any way. It was said that after the shooting, a neighbor found him wandering nearby, so he was okay, and I believe he still is okay to this day. At this point, police had received numerous reports about someone open firing and then fleeing the scene. One neighbor reports that she heard 12 shots one after the other that day. The police, like I just said, at this point, they believed that the shooter may still be in the area and that there may have been a risk to the community. But police also said that they received multiple calls from neighbors who reported that they saw the shooter flee in a car. And another caller who we will discuss in just a few minutes, they reported that he was headed towards the mountains. They also gave a description of the man's car, which was a black Mercedes-Benz with a Colorado license plate. Less than an hour later, a man in a car with the same description was pulled over after he tried blowing through a red light. I did see it reported that way, but I also saw that they knew who the suspect was and they pinged his phone to the area. I'm not exactly sure which report is true. Basically, all the reports said that he was pulled over, didn't really say how they tracked him down, but these are the two different ways that I've heard it reported. Either way, when the man was stopped, the officer walked up to the car and he noticed that on the passenger side floorboard was a rifle with a high capacity magazine as well as a Glock 17 handgun. Of course, this officer quickly realized that this was the man who had just shot and killed an innocent young woman woman and gravely injured an innocent young man. After searching the rest of this man's car, he was also found to have a gun bell as well as several other high-capacity magazines as well. So, this man turned out to be 36-year-old Michael Close. Upon investigation, it turned out that Michael Close was in his apartment when he shot both Bella and Darian with an AK-47 rifle. Of course, he initially tried denying this, but surveillance video actually caught him opening the blinds to his apartment and firing out of the window at the same time that both of these people were killed. At his apartment, it was also found that there were six shell casings inside of the apartment and 18 more shell casings on the ground just outside of his window. So, this confirmed that he opened fire and shot 24 times in quick succession. So, police arrested and charged Michael Close with one count of first-degree murder, two counts of attempted murder, and two counts of assault. His trial for murder started in March of 2021, and he pled not guilty due to reason of insanity. Now, his defense claimed that Michael's abusive childhood, a personality disorder, and a history of mental health issues, that is what is to blame for the shooting. They explained that Michael had been abused as a child until his biological father gave up custody of him when he was 17 years old. After that, he was legally adopted by another couple. As a teenager, he suffered with severe depression and had one instance of attempting to take his own life. At this time, he was diagnosed with a personality disorder, which I haven't been able to find exactly which personality disorder, but he was diagnosed with that as well as depression but he did not want to get treatment for it. However, Michael had no criminal history and no history of any kind of violence. They described that in the months and weeks leading up to the shootings, the tension in Michael's life was just building and things just were not going well for Michael. By January of 2020, Michael had just broken up with his long-term girlfriend of five years. After that, he lost his jobs of working at a bar and then at a marijuana dispensary because of the pandemic. He also used working out as a way to release tension, but when the gyms closed down because of the pandemic, he lost his ability to work out, which also was devastating for him. 
Then on the night of June 9th, 2020, his ex-girlfriend had paid him a visit. They had been drinking alcohol for the majority of the night, but all they did was argue that night. Then on the morning of June 10th, he texted the same ex and told her that his dogs had just been attacked by another dog at the dog park. During this call, he said that he planned to execute this dog's owner with a gun or a knife. The owners of the dog involved in this alleged attack were not Bella or Darian. Neither of them had any connection or anything to do with that incident. So it was said that after Michael heard the way that Darian was speaking to the dog, he became enraged. He then yelled out to the couple and then went and grabbed his AK-47 from another room. That is when he returned back to the window and then opened fire, shooting off 24 rounds, one after another. Then after the shooting, he actually called his ex-girlfriend crying and was apologizing over and over and over again. He admitted that he had just killed two people. She tried telling him to turn himself in, but he kept saying that he was afraid to. He was saying that he was going to drive over to the mountains to kill himself and then asked her to take care of his dogs. So this report of him fleeing the scene and driving off to the mountains, that was the ex-girlfriend calling the police. Then after this phone call, Michael got into his SUV and then drove west before he got pulled over. The ex-girlfriend said that he had every intention of taking his life after that shooting. She also said that Michael was not mentally stable on the morning of the shooting and he hadn't been mentally stable for pretty much the majority of the time that she knew him. She said that he had a long history of abusing drugs like cocaine, molly, mushrooms, ketamine, and ecstasy and he had been sober for three years until he recently started drinking again. It also came out that a friend of Michael's received a text from him where he said that he was angry with a couple and their dog that morning. Then Michael called the same friend that morning saying, dude, I really effed up, really effing bad. There's no going back from this now. Now, in the initial reports of the shooting, it was stated that the gun used in this attack was an AR-15 but as we know, it was actually an AK-47 with a large capacity magazine, which is actually illegal in Colorado. So I don't believe an AK is illegal in Colorado, but I do think the large capacity magazines, that's what's illegal in Colorado. Now, this gun was actually registered to a man named Daniel Politica the same friend who Michael had texted that morning about being angry and saying that he's effed. Daniel was the owner of a company called Tyrant Arms LLC, a local gun shop. Now, I saw that this gun shop wasn't up and operating at the time of this shooting, so I don't know if it had been closed down or if it was sort of just an idea that was still being built and that it wasn't, you know, in fruition yet, but that's basically what he owned. He owned a local gun shop, but he also worked as a sergeant with the Denver Police Department. It turned out that after Daniel had heard about this shooting involving Michael and an AK-47, he went around his house searching for the AK-47 and that's when he realized that it was missing. That is when he realized that Michael had stolen his gun without Daniel's knowledge or permission when visiting his house. After discovering this, of course, he reported it to the police, but this wasn't reported until about 10 to 12 days after the shooting. Daniel would later say that him and other friends had been very worried about Michael's mental health and that they were trying to get him to go see a therapist. Some friends said that he confided in them that he had been sexually abused as a child. Other friends said that he confided in them that when he was 12, he was sent to a mental institution because he had thoughts of harming himself, but the friends never thought that Michael would harm anybody else except himself. After receiving these messages from Michael that day, Daniel said that he was actually going to get him help that same day, 
but of course he didn't get the chance to because he shot two people. So at trial, Michael's defense tried to argue that Mike had suffered a mental break that day. He was disassociated. He was out of his head. He didn't consider anything else at that time. He didn't even know what he was doing when he shot Bella and Darian. However, the prosecution argued that this was a rage-motivated mission for respect. They said that Michael was sane during the shooting, that he just acted on a long boiling rage because he felt disrespected in other areas of his life. He was just stewing with anger and he wanted to take it out on somebody. I also want to note that there actually was surveillance video at the dog park where Michael claimed his dog was attacked at and there was no evidence of his dog being attacked. In fact, there was no evidence of him ever being at that dog park that morning at all. It also showed that this text was sent to the friend about 10 minutes before the shooting, so it seemed like this was some sort of excuse or plan or justification for his anger. So, after hearing both sides, which again presented pretty much all of the evidence that I just discussed here, both sides rested and now it was up to the jury to make their decision. At the end, the jury deliberated for less than a day before coming back with their verdict. They found Michael Close guilty on one count of first-degree murder with the qualifier of extreme indifference, two counts of attempted first-degree murder, and two counts of first-degree assault, because of this, he was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. As a result of Bella's murder and Darian's attempted murder, Anna pushed to have a new law passed in Colorado, and in April of 2021, the bill called the Isabella Act was passed into Colorado law. This bill states that anybody who owns a firearm that is lost or stolen must report it to the police within five days. So, my hope is that, you know, this law will make gun owners more responsible as to where their guns are. As somebody who doesn't have, you know, a ton of guns, I don't have an armory, you know, I have a couple of different weapons, but I definitely don't have a lot. I've definitely misplaced it before, but I know that if I misplace it, I need to find it because if I don't and somebody else does, that could end very badly for me. I am very responsible. I don't want anybody to take that as like, I just am willy-nilly with my guns. I actually will tell you the situation. I brought one with me when I was going on a long hike by myself. I had it in my backpack that I carry with me on my hikes. I came home, I put the backpack down, and then I sort of forgot about it for a couple days, and then I realized that, you know, my gun was missing, and then I knew it was in the backpack, but in that moment, I was like, oh my gosh, it was sitting in my backpack, which was still in my apartment, but I was like, I cannot do that. And obviously after that, I make sure I put it exactly back where it was. I put it where I know it's going to be at all times. But that is a moment where I realized that I was not being the most responsible with my guns. It was sitting in a backpack. It wasn't locked away in the safe that I keep it in. And so if something were to happen where someone came in and maybe took the backpack, that could have ended poorly for me because it wasn't by where it normally is. It was somewhere else in my backpack. So that's just a situation where I do understand how it easily can be misplaced, but it also showed me like a swift kick in the butt that I need to be way more responsible when I take my gun out of my house. So once again, the reason I'm telling that story is because my hope is that with this new law, that people who own more than one gun and use them and take them different places, or if you have like a room with a bunch of guns in it, or if you have guns around the house, that you regularly check to make sure that those guns are there. Whether you have people over, whether you have kids, especially if their friends are coming over, if anybody finds a gun in your house and takes it and you don't know about it, that's still on you. So the fact that Daniel didn't know that his gun was stolen, I still think that that's on him. He should have stored it better, which we will get more into in literally like just a minute, but it's his responsibility to keep track of his gun. So while I do understand that it wasn't his fault that the shooting took place, 
he should have been a lot more responsible with how he stored his guns. That being said, Bella's father, Joshua, as well as Darian, they worked together to file a civil suit against Daniel Politica, stating that Daniel needs to be held accountable. They stated that Daniel failed to responsibly and securely store his AK-47 that was used in the shooting. So, they claimed in the suit that Daniel, as well as his company, Tyrant Arms LLC, were negligent in allowing Michael to have access to the gun. It stated that they have a, quote, common law duty to exercise proper care in the purchase, storage, sharing, selling, maintenance, supervision of weapons and ammunition that are purchased, including a weapon such as an AK-47 and the ammunition used to fire at Isabella Thales and Darian Simon. As a result, the suit claims that the defendants, quote, breached the statutory duties by violating Colorado laws regarding a failure to use a locking device on the weapon, transferring a large capacity magazine to individuals not permitted to possess the item, and transferring a firearm to a defendant without performing a background check. The document goes on to argue, quote, as a direct and approximate result of the defendant's negligence and negligence per se, plaintiffs suffered injuries, damages, and losses, including but not limited to economic, non-economic, and impairment damages such as permanent physical impairment, emotional distress, loss of enjoyment of life, and great mental and physical pain and suffering. They don't understand why it took Daniel so long to report his gun as missing, and they think that there may be more to this story. In response, Daniel explained that him and Michael had been close friends for several years, meeting for the first time when they were in high school. In early 2020, Michael was living in a home owned by Daniel. He said that when Michael was staying at his house, in exchange for being allowed to stay there, Michael would help him pack all of his stuff up and then send to another home that Daniel was moving into. He explained that he kept the AK-47 for personal protection and that it had nothing to do with his job, so it wasn't a police department issued gun, it was his own personal gun. He said that he kept this gun in a gap between the master closet as well as a wall he said that he believed that this gun was actually stolen from the closet months before the shooting took place when Michael was at his house and helping him pack. He said that he never actually got around to checking for the gun because he never ended up unpacking the majority of his stuff. Like I said earlier, in the initial reportings of the shooting, it stated that the gun used in the crime was an AR-15. So, when he saw these reports, he didn't look for his AK because he didn't think it was related. Like I said, they were reporting that it was an AR-15 for a week or two. So, it wasn't until, you know, a week or two later that reports started coming out with Michael's identity saying that an AK was used that Daniel actually thought to search for it. So, he's explaining that that is why it took the 10 to 12 days to report the gun as stolen because the initial reportings were saying that it was an AR-15, not an AK-47. So, you know, that's why he didn't think to look for it. So, obviously, that's not an excuse for Daniel at all. He should have known where all of his guns are in the first place, but it does go to show how important accurate reporting is. That some people might think it was a small detail, like, oh, we assumed it was an AR-15 because it was a rifle, and, you know, those are the scary guns that everybody knows about, so we're just going to report it as that. But, it was important that it was accurately reported and it wasn't. So, the fact that they specifically said it was an AR-15 and not a, you know, long barrel rifle, which would be the more general term because if you don't know what the gun is exactly, you would just say a rifle or a pistol or whatever the type of gun is instead of saying the specific name. That's just sort of my bias coming out. I think that a lot of times people assume it's an AR-15 because that's a popular gun that is well known. So, Again, I think that is why accurate reporting is very important because, again, I think if he did report this gun as missing much earlier, obviously, it wouldn't have changed the outcome, but it could have made things go a lot quicker. So, that is all I know about the civil suit. As far as I've seen, I don't know if we know the results of the civil suit. If you know, please let me know because I looked it up and I haven't seen it reported anywhere that specifically states the results, whether it was settled, whether, you know, 
either party lost or won or whatever. So if you know, please leave that in the comments below, but otherwise it may still be ongoing. Then the last thing that I want to mention about this case is that in August of 2022, a park bench in the ballpark neighborhood was dedicated as a memorial to Bella. It reads, Isabella Joy Thallis, 1999 to 2020, forever besides you, never forgotten. We love you to the moon and back. Mommy, Lucia, and Jacob. The bench is located near a wall which has a mural of Isabella. Her mother, Anna, stated, quote, This is her home. I'm hoping it'll be named Bella Joy Gardens. There's nurture in nature. We always had plants around the house, and Isabella was starting to garden with her boyfriend, Darian. There is now an Instagram page dedicated to the Bella Joy Gardens, and you can see that their mission is to support others who have faced violence and continue to keep Bella's memory alive. I also want to mention that Darian has a GoFundMe page to help raise money for for his ongoing medical expenses for all of the care that he needs. I don't know if this is an active page, but I have seen that recently people have donated. I'm going to donate some of the money from this video to his medical expenses because you shouldn't have to go through that alone and all of the things that he's gone through hopefully, you know, money shouldn't be an issue. Hopefully, he can get all of the care that he needs. So, if you do have any extra money, please go ahead and donate it to help out with his medical expenses. Darian is also out there just spreading awareness on gun violence and also working to keep Bella's memory alive. It's truly amazing to see what he's doing and just how strong of a person he is. I can't even begin to fathom just how tragic this case is. When I say that she was murdered so senselessly and so randomly for absolutely no reason, this case fits that definition perfectly. She literally was just existing in the same space as a man who felt like he had no control over his life and felt that everybody else was to blame for it. I truly cannot comprehend what this has been like for Darian or the rest of Bella's family. All I can hope at this point is that the family has found peace in creating a new law that can hopefully enact some change and by keeping her memory alive with this park bench and this beautiful mural and these gardens. So that is all I have for today's case. As with all of these cases, my heart truly goes out to Bella's family, Darian, and everybody else who loved Bella. She seemed like such a strong young woman who literally did absolutely nothing wrong to cause this tragedy. She truly was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. But either way, that is where I am going to end today's video, and now I want to hear your guys' thoughts. What do you think about the new law that passed? What do you think about Daniel's story as to how Michael got a hold of his gun? What do you think of Michael's mental state? Please let me know any thoughts that you have on this case in the comments below. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to go ahead to turn the notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Don't forget to go ahead and follow my Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below. And if you have absolutely any case suggestions, please make sure you go ahead and use the Google form, which I have listed down below. I have found that to be a much more streamlined way of taking case suggestions. So once again, if you have a case that you would like to see covered on this channel, make sure you use my Google form down below. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye.